Alrighty. Thoughts, words. That's pretty good stuff. Like, don't like, wrong. Never <laughs> seen. Yeah. It's really good. They've done a great job. Yeah. So, what y'all got? Can I get a light right here, please? Obviously, again, took a few liberties, you know, to connect stories and such. Um, seemed to be a little less maybe in this than some of the other episodes, but um, it seems more personal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, yeah, they're all up. <laughs> I just thought about him standing there telling them that just because those other people had done something that they deserved him just as much as they did. And I look at the world today and I think of how we look at the other people be guilty and, you know, the same thing. Yeah, we judge all the time. I mean, we always compare ourselves to others and who, you know, is better than we are or who we're better than most of the time is what we're thinking of. So, for sure. What else? We know Jesus stayed in Samaria for a couple of days, mm -hmm. three days in French, but yeah. we don't know what went on. But right, so... Yeah, what they're showing very well could happen. Right, so we know he stayed there a few days, like Tom's saying, we know that, that's scriptural, and so, you know, some of the liberties were maybe what he did while he was there. We know he preached, we know he taught, we know everybody, um, the town came to believe, and, um, you know, we know Fatina is the word they use here for the, for the name they're given to the woman at the well. We know she went back and told everybody, and um, it is uh, the woman in the market when um, Simon Peter went to get the wine, that actually, again, that's how they portrayed it. The scripture itself, though, is from John 4, verses 39 through 42. It says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So. <coughs> there, it's not recorded, uh, kind of like some stuff to, uh, maybe Tom was talking about. Um, it's not recorded that he actually preached in the synagogue there. It's possible, you know. Um, we don't know that he stayed at the woman at the well's house. But he had to stay somewhere, you know, so it could have been. Um, Melek is not, that gentleman and his story is not specifically in the Bible, but I love the way they use that to tie in the scripture of the, you know, the lost sheep. So, um, comes from. You know, I have this stuff in order of the series, but we never talk about it in order, so then I have to find it. <laughs> I think the way it's done, it gives the, it shows us the humanity, of, you know, of, of the humanness of the bull, of the disciples. Yeah. <laughs> that they, you know, they, they bickered and they talked and joked. And and we know they fought about who was the greatest among them. <laughs> you know, they were always going back and forth about that. So. I got kind of tickled with the way they keep worrying about protecting Jesus. <laughs> when... You know, they're, they're the ones that need protecting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they're more afraid than he is. He's calm about everything and they're really uptight about everything. For certain. What else? I don't know if it's a liberty the director took on this or not, but it's showing the disciples need to learn more than some of the others. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely having to learn. And, you know, why is it so important they get it? Are they going to be the ones left to share? You know, so they, they've got to pick it up because he's counting on them. They don't know it yet, obviously, but... Um, oh, I did crack up, at the, and I heard several of you, the little joke with... 
Melick when he uh, saw him out. <laughs> we never know who might get it. Thought we might meet along the road. I love how they show his sense of humor. So. Um, when did he have God have a sense of humor? You and me both, or when and me both. Well, when, when we stand there and he says, I told you, and I, what? Hey, I don't care really what you thought. He <laughs> better have a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we pray he has a sense of humor. And it show, this shows that he, he's human, he's like yeah. us, he likes to laugh. He made Duckville platypus. He's got to have a sense of <laughs> Well, here's something to think about, too. The people who followed Jesus' as disciples that were, you can tell, they're talking about making a plan and all this. They had a lot of um, insecurity and anxiety about what the next day would hold as far as not knowing the plan, where we're going to go, what we're going to do. But if you think about it, he, if he had called maybe a bunch of homeless people that had absolutely nothing to lose, following Jesus wouldn't really have meant anything to them because it would have been an improvement over their current status. Every one of them had a life. They were fishermen. They were whatever. They had family. They all had material possessions of whatever, and they gave it up to follow him. And how many of us would give up everything and just go follow Jesus wherever, you know, or more to the point, following without knowing yeah. where we were going. Yeah. So it's, it's easy for us to look back and say, well, the disciples were a doubting bunch, or they weren't so great, or whatever, but would we have been any better? Oh, I, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm near as smart as Matthew was, but I... Um, I definitely relate to him and to um, Thomas wanting to make a plane or even, you know, the others because I want to know what's coming. Plan it out. We're going to be prepared. We're going to be ready. And, uh, yeah, I, that would have been me. <laughs> that whole, like... I think we all struggle with that one. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. So. He, he knew he didn't... He wasn't time for the men to know whose field they were plowing, mm -hmm. what would they have done if they, well, this is a Samaritan's field you're plowing. How many times in our life have we done the same, we've done something and then went, well, if I would known that's who it was for. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're all guilty of that, right? Like, Jesus has to do something that we see who reaps the reward for it, and we're like, well, I want to, goes back to what you're talking about, I was running like, I wouldn't have done that for them. Yeah. And, you know, we're doing the whole up and down looking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, we still struggle with that. I'm glad farming's improved. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> Could you imagine having a till of a uh, garden like that? That's why Janet cuts the grass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, um, I really like how they started this episode looking forward, you know, we've looked back on several others, but this one looking forward to when John wrote mm -hmm. the book of John. And again, you know, we don't know exactly how that came to be, but it was cool to, um, you know, see how it possibly could have done, been done in recording the different things and the things that happened and, um, and then getting to see kind of an account from each one of the disciples, you know. Um, I really like the interaction between Mother Mary and John mm -hmm. and how they portrayed that. So um, just as a reminder, if you caught that, him calling her mother, that half, that was in John 19, 25 through 27, when Jesus was on the cross. It says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple who he, who he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took, into her, took her into his home. So that's the connection there, um, in case we, you had forgotten it or, or whatever. But So, um, you know, he took her under his care and, and, and she became his mother, so, or at least he became her son. 
Um, and it interesting, you know, John in the episode saying, well, I'm the one he loved. <laughs> and just so you know, the only times that's recorded in Scripture is in the book of John. <laughs> just saying. It was a noun that is read. And then it's also um, in John 13, 23. It says, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter mentioned to this disciple and, and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And that's at the, the table when they're talking about who the, the uh, traitor will be. So. There was a lot of scripture in that beginning part and then tied back in in the end. Um, so in... Um, Mary talking about she treasured the things in her heart. That's from Luke 2, 16 through 19. Um, of course, we know that's when Jesus was born. Um, John 20, 30 through 31. Uh, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And I thought it was cool how they used the thunder yeah. Kind of like a little nod. All right, Jesus saying, yep, yep, use that. You know, <laughs> when we were talking. Um, and then, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's actually in Matthew uh, 5, 17 through 18, Mark 13, 30 through 31, and Luke 21, 32 through 33. So, uh, several reported him saying that. Before he called them the sons of the thunder, um, about calling them the Storm the ocean or whatever. Is that scriptural? Yes. Uh, Sons of Thunder comes from Mark 3.17. Um, I didn't write it down, but I'll pull it up and read it. It helps to understand the different writing styles between John and Matthew also. Yes, because Matthew's was very much a more detailed account. Um, written, and I'll come back. I hadn't forgot. I got it right here. Um, more from his Jewish background, you know, the the upright, making sure things are recorded properly, and, you know, this kind of stuff, like it would have been more in a Jewish writing. That was his taxpayer. Yeah, <laughs> his, his, lear, his learning that uh, taught him that. Uh, Ma, um, Sons of Thunder is in Mark three seventeen for one. And it's when Jesus appoints the twelve, it says Jesus went up, well, it's 13 through 17, but Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the names Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So. No, I, that's not what I was asking. I had, I, the part where he actually says a storm on the ocean or whatever, prior to calling him. So. Oh, no, um, that was just how he was kind of getting to how he named him that. I apologize. Okay. So, but if the, uh, the interaction between the Samaritans and James and John is recorded. That's in Luke 9. Um... 51 through 56. As the time approached for him to be taken, a oh, long, long one. Mm -hmm. Try to I bet it's John, I wrote Luke. Because we know I have a problem with that. <laughs> I don't know why. There's only four Gospels. No. <laughs> well, I, well, and I wrote the wrong one down, apparently. 25% chance. <laughs> So far, I'm striking out. You say you like the Matthew? <laughs> yeah, apparently not. <laughs> well, I wrote the wrong one down. Anyway, um, if we think back to the sermons that we did on the disciples uh, before we started the series, it is actually recorded the uh, interaction between James and John and the Samaritans who um, kind of came at Jesus, and the two of them wanted to, to strike them with bolts of. Mm -hmm. Thunder and li or with lightning, which is just hysterical to me. But uh, so that is scriptural. Yeah, they, wanted, they wanted to burn them with fire. Yep, <laughs> that is in there. So. And Jesus said to them, "You people don't know what you don't know what kind of people you are." Yep. 
And um, that's right. How many times do we get in the way? I mean, we do. We we mean well. We have good intentions. You know, we're we're trying. But we just need to get ourselves out of the way most of the time and let him do it. <laughs> they say the road to hell is paved with good, good intentions. Yeah. That's exactly right. So none of us are none of us are worthy. Um in the at the end, the scripture that um a couple of different scriptures they talked about. Um that I am who I am is from Exodus 3, 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And then John 8, 58, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. And he was saying, Jesus was saying that to the Pharisees. And you know the Pharisees got the, uh, the connection there. So he was proving a point. And then... Um, what they quote, quoted of David saying was from Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. So, there is no record of him actually being in a um, synagogue help, of John helping pick out scripture, but you know, it was kind of how to, to bring that together. So, it, also, it also showed the difference between the Jews and the Samaritans. Now, they only had the first five books. They didn't have yep. the rest of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of that hadn't changed either, has it? Because you know the the Catholics have different than we do, and there's books that weren't included, and you know, so some of that's still going on. You travel in that area now, and the Jews and the Samaritans are still separated. I would have loved to see maybe the director at the end where John prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to guide him. Because mm. there's nothing referencing the Holy Spirit's guidance in the writing. Yeah. And that would have been such a nice it would have. direction to go. Yeah. And I don't know if y'all could see it um, from where you're at on here, but they did show him crying at the end when Jesus is reading in the synagogue. There's, there was tears. Um, maybe that's what they were going for. I can't, I'm not going to try to put words in their mouth, but it did show that it was at least touching him. So, but no, I get it. I do. I'm trying to think how if, and trying to think off through back through season one, Holy Spirit moments. I don't know that. I right off my head, I can't think. So. You come away with the sense though that the disciples still hadn't figured out that Jesus' kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. Mm -hmm. They were still expecting him to set up some kind of kingdom on earth and give them some kind of positions yeah. of responsibility within the kingdom and get rid of the Romans and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. They didn't figure that out until Pentecost. They really didn't. Mm -hmm. After, After his death. His death yeah. That was when it finally clicked. In season three, there is some Holy Spirit moments in season three when he sends them out yes. for miracles. <laughs> yes, yes. So maybe the disciples aren't prepared or are not far enough along. Mm -hmm. yes. This was at the end where John was right. after the death, right? Oh, that's right, when he was writing the yeah, story. Yeah, right. yeah, when he was writing back. Yeah, yeah. That would be a good nice. point. That yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I pick it now. So that the Holy Spirit came Yeah, back. you're right. That would have been a good part for it. I was trying to figure out at the beginning when they were talking about mourning for Big James. He what, has been martyred at this yeah. point. This was... So this, at the very beginning, they're in that room reminiscing back yes. mm -hmm. about Jesus. Right. And when he said something about this was going to, told his mother, this is going to happen to more of us. Yes. So that's when Herod took James and had him executed or whatever. Yeah. At the beginning, and of course when they brought it back at the end, um, is it was looking forward instead mm -hmm. of looking back. And um, they've all come together. Um, and Big James has been martyred. So he's feeling the urgency to get things written down before the rest of them. And this is right before the scattering because when he martyred James, it was about that time that they scattered in all directions because he started going after all the Christians. Yeah. So he was right that they probably wouldn't see each other again in the same room for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and what John was writing in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, 
does tie into Genesis 1, mm -hmm. what Jesus was reading in the synagogue. So, um. He got his disclaimer in there. He got his disclaimer in there, that's right. Mm -hmm. So we don't know that miracle where he made the farmer walk or any of those could happen. Yes. We don't know. That's right. We know, I mean, he he preached, he taught, and I'm sure he healed people. I mean, it's Jesus. He can heal somebody. You know? Not every miracle was recorded. Right. Anything else? <coughs> We see them every day. Still happen. Well, I mean, <laughs> we just don't call them that anymore. Exactly. And Jesus sent messengers ahead of him, who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, "Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them?" It's Luke 9, 52 through 54. I don't know why I couldn't find it. Anyway. James and John spent a lot of time with Jesus. They personally experienced his forgiveness, patience, and graciousness. They watched him welcome all kinds of people with all kinds of problems, even Samaritans, with no strings attached. They witnessed him heal the, spirituality, the spiritually possessed and the physically oppressed. They saw him turn the other cheek when he was mocked or rejected pouring himself out to serve and to seek and to save. Yet somehow, after all that, the brothers thought Jesus might give a thumbs up to their murder plan. Oh, the irony of the Thunder Twins calling for harsh punishment of others when they'd been on the receiving end of unmerited grace. But that's what we humans tend to do. We recognize our own desperate need for Jesus only to forget it once we know him. We compare ourselves to those we deem worse, judging the hearts and minds of others as though we're in any position to do so, all the while failing to extend the very love and mercy we've been re repeatedly shown by God himself. But blessed are the poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit isn't a money thing, though being financially poor sometimes makes it easier to be poor in spirit. Lack of any kind has a way of tenderizing our hearts and exposing our real need. Conversely, wealth sometimes makes it harder to be poor in spirit since it fosters self-sufficiency and even pride, which are enemies of the lowly posture required to be poor in spirit. Indeed, some of the terms for poor in the Bible were regularly used for those so lowly, so disadvantaged and distressed they needed outside intervention, which isn't far from how we sometimes use the word today. For example, when we see a news report of a horrific accident and a man being cut from his car and rushed to the hospital, we might say, that poor guy. Of course, we're not referring to his bank account. We're referring to his desperate need for intervention and help. In the Sermon on the Mount, the poor Jesus refers to are those who are ready and willing to look to God for help. Because when we recognize our own spiritual bankruptcy, our desperate need to be saved from sin and all its consequences, we get real low real fast. And if we're smart, we stay there. To be poor in spirit means to take a knee now and forevermore. It means to live and surrender to our Savior, relying on Him for the help we can't possibly provide ourselves. To be sure, the Samaritans who offended James and John had their own sin issues and their prejudice toward the Jews closed their ears and hearts to who Jesus really was. But then their rejection of Jesus led to the disciples' rejection of Jesus' authority, at least in that moment. Because calling down fire from heaven to destroy an entire village is the opposite of what Jesus was teaching his followers to do. They took their eyes off their leader and hardcore stared at their circumstances, which caused their self-righteous self-sufficiency to wield its ugly head. Alternatively, when we're bent low, it's Jesus who lifts our heads. And it's Jesus who leads us on. Which means those who are poor in spirit don't have the time or inclination to judge others because they're too busy, one, doing battle with their own ongoing sin, two, continually experiencing the grace that saved them in the first place, and three, keeping their eyes <coughs> on Jesus and his kingdom. A kingdom that, incidentally, is already here.
Anybody want to pray us out? Or anybody got anything else? Anybody want to pray? Sure, I will. Lord, we give thanks for this. Open our hearts and minds to your word, the things we're supposed to do, and to understand that it's for all, for everyone we come in contact with. It is your kingdom and not ours. We're just the tear cakers for a short period of time. Give us strength and courage. We ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen. I'll give you your homework on the way out. <laughs> <coughs>